and we'll get started. Um, gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your presence in our lives as we've just come past our time that we set aside for Thanksgiving and gratitude, And but we should never stop. We just are glad to be reminded of it and set us at a time. We ask, Father, that you will guide us and be with us as we go through this lesson four, <coughs> as we finish up next week with lesson five. And we ask that you will take us through this lesson because it's not an easy one. Um, the information is, is difficult. It's some truths that we need to have really ingrained. And this needs to be something that causes us to have, um, to be convicted and to have a response. Not something that we just learned, but something that definitely needs to be uh, a solid application. So we ask that you would give us the, the, the truth and that we would we would see it clearly as you have laid it out this week for us we would be able to discuss it and that we would at the end apply it in a way that helps us to know what are our marching orders what is it that you would have us to do how are we to live in light of all this so we just ask that you guide us in that and we know your holy spirit is with us and we'll do that and that your truth will be revealed um, we thank you for that in advance and we ask for it in jesus name and for his sake as well. Amen. Okay, so as I said in my prayer, this is not an easy lesson. <laughs> this book is not an easy book. Um, I've loved it, but it is tough, partly because um, all of us, I, I, I don't know your lives and I don't know who, I mean, I know some, but I don't know really what's going on in your lives and in your churches and in your families, but I can guarantee you there's someone, someone, that's gonna fit in this category. Um, and we'll get to that as we go through our lesson. Um, we're gonna to look today at the ungodly. We're gonna look at who they are and what they do. It's part of who they are. We're gonna look at what is their end? What is their destination? What is true for them? And then we're gonna look at what are we to do in light of it? I hope you can see that. Um, if not, you know, hopefully you've got your notes, just get your notes out. Um, so as we look in the book of Jude, um, we know this book, we're going to do a little review. We know this book was written by a man named Jude, short for Judas, we believe. We believe this is the half-brother half of Jesus. We know it's the brother of James. We believe that is the James that wrote the book of James and is also the half-brother of Jesus. So these were two men that were not believers during Jesus's earthly life and ministry, but they have become believers, strong believers. And we also know, like, I don't know what your story is, but you probably have a similar story. If you were raised in church, there was a point in time that you became a Christian, but all of that prior exposure, Sunday school lessons, maybe even Bible study, because in my case, I was a, an adult. All of that, like, is just kind of in your pocket as you become a Christian. It's not like as you become a Christian suddenly. Now, there are some people obviously that had zero Christian background prior to being saved, if that's true of you, then maybe everything post-salvation was new and, and learned by you. But chances are you had some exposure. Chances are you had some great little, maybe Bible stories or, or a child's Bible lesson, for instance, and, and, and children's church and lessons and things like that, that God just used every bit of that from your salvation point forward and helped you understand it better and everything. So similarly with Jude, with his exposure to Jesus, all of Jesus, all his life, you know, Jesus was older, but all of his life, Jude would have, like, when he came to truth, all of that would have been available. So he's got a background that is incredible when you think about it. Probably might have had a little bit of envy and jealousy <laughs> because it would have been tough to have been the younger brother of a literally perfect older brother. <laughs> uh, if you've got siblings, you know, sometimes those sibling relationships can be tough. But here we have Jude. He calls himself a bondservant of Jesus, not a brother. Um, it's an interesting point. Does call himself a brother to James, but not to Jesus. And he says of himself that he's called and he's beloved. He's among those he's speaking to um, as he writes this letter. We know this, this is a letter. We know it's from him to a group of people. 
they're not named as far as like to identify a town, for instance. We just know he's writing to believers. And we know he had a purpose in his writing that changed. Um, his purpose at start was to talk about their common salvation, meaning they're all saved. Instead, he wrote to them about what we're going to talk about today. And one of those things in verse three is that they, so his purpose is that they do what? Contend for the faith. Right. And that is true for us as well, is that they are to contend earnestly for the faith, and so are we. And the reason is these ungodly people or these certain persons have done what? They crept in unnoticed <laughs> and they've turned the grace of God into what? Into licentiousness, right? And they deny who? Jesus. They deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, so these are some of the, some, the truths that we've seen before, but we're going to put them up there again as to who this group of people are. And this is part of the purpose for why Jude is writing. Um, we then looked last week at verses five to eight, mainly five to seven, where it's talking about these Old Testament examples. And we know from other parts of scripture even that these are written as examples that we know about them. And Jude would have been talking to a group that would have also known about them. And so he's calling on their knowledge and he's talking about the groups that came out of the Exodus, and he's not talking about the Egyptians, he's talking about the Israelites or those that were with the Israelites that didn't believe. And as a result of their not believing, they were destroyed. We know a big one from that is at the moment where they could have gone into the land and they didn't because two of them said go and 10 said no. And they, um, they rejected they rebelled against God, and as a result, they were destroyed over time, over a 40-year period. That entire generation of 20 years old and up men that, that had denied going in. And so that's one example of the people during that time, but there's also a lot of others. If you know the history, we looked at some of it, but there's the ones that were bitten by snakes, that then they had to look at the staff. There's um, those that Balaam um, counseled Balak to um, entice them into idol worship. And there was a plague. There were several plagues that broke out over time. We looked at Korah's rebellion last week. We looked at um, the uh, just several different examples. And again, over and over and over, if you read the Exodus account, and again, that's where I am, I'm just finishing Deuteronomy. But if you read through that in your Bible, and some of us studied it even, you will see many, many, many examples of groups at times that were destroyed um, by plagues and other things. So again, one of the big ones is they didn't believe enough to go in. And they were destroyed because of their lack of belief. Um, there's another group, he talks about the angels um, that did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. And now they're in eternal bonds of darkness uh, for the day, the judgment of the great day. We saw the example of Sodom and Gomorrah and <coughs> the cities around them. They indulged in gross immorality. Um, we know that specifically to be hom homosexuality, but gross immorality can cover any sexual sin. So it, they may and probably were doing more. Usually there's not just one perversion. There's usually so many more. They went after strange flesh. They're exhibited as an example. And they went under, they're undergoing punishment by eternal fire. But we also know that fire rained down from heaven and destroyed those cities. So that's, that's a temporal fire. But they undergo punishment. 
Then it says in verse eight, in the same manner, these men, talking about again, we're back to here. These men also by dreaming, <coughs> what do they do? Defile the flesh and reject authority. Right, defile the flesh, reject authority. What else do they do? Angelic majesty. They, yes, they revile the <coughs> angelic majesties. Okay, now it's it's relating um, in the same manner, meaning talking about the the people that are discussed in Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance, and even the angels and the ones that were of the Exodus also did these things. Each time it's, it's linking them. So it's saying in the same manner, these men, the men that Jude is talking about during his time, it says also by dreaming. So sometimes their imaginations or they come up with these ideas or whatever, they defile the flesh just like these did. They rejected authority just like these did that we saw before and they revile angelic majesties. Now that one is more linked to the next verse than it is as much, but it's saying that's what happened before as well. Angels even can revile angels and angelic majesties. There is a hierarchy among angels, for instance, because as we looked up this week with Michael, Michael's called in verse nine, what is Michael called? Archangel. Called an archangel. That's a hierarchy. In other words, he would be above a group, let's say, of angels. So Michael is not a person. He's an archangel. And what did Michael do in verse 9? Contended with the devil and, and was disputing about the body of Moses. Right. And as a result of even that argument, being an archangel, being in the position he's in, speaking to the devil, he did not, he did not pronounce against yeah. him a reviling judgment, but he did say, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, so <clears throat> not to go down a big rabbit trail here, because we could, <laughs> this is actually something that we need to think about if you've ever been encountered someone, or maybe you yourself have heard this or even said this, so I'm not stepping on toes here. I'm just saying you may have been at a time or have heard somebody say, you know, I rebuke the devil. I'm not supposed to be talking to him. I don't feel. And I certainly don't have the power or the position that Michael has. Not at this point, not as, an, uh, not as a human. I'm made a little lower than the angels, Hebrews tells us. So Michael, being above even some angels, has a much higher power and position than I do currently. And he did not feel it was within his realm to, to uh, pronounce a railing judgment against the devil. He did say, the Lord rebuke you. So if you want to take anything from this, say, if you feel like you're under spiritual warfare and that's valid, it's true and it's valid. Satan is alive and well doing his stuff. Um, and he's got a lot of workers. And if you really feel, and he, Ephesians tells us that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against those realms, those angelic majesties, for instance. It's not our place to pronounce a railing judgment. It's our place possibly to say the Lord rebuke you. You know, ask God for help. Ask God to take care of it. Recognize it for what it is. So if you've ever, or you've ever heard of someone saying, you know, I bound Satan, I don't have that power. And I would just caution you to not start those, those conversations, not start those things. But the real, the first word of nine is the word, but it is a contrast to the end of verse eight, where it's saying these people feel like they have the power to revile angelic majesties, whereas Michael did not feel he had the ability to uh, pronounce a railing judgment. He did argue, and he argued over the body of Moses. Now, there's no cross-reference for this. 
There is no place in scripture that it tells us otherwise, uh, uh, except for here, other place that tells anything about arguing over the body of Moses. I don't know if you went and looked it up, but we know Moses died because there's people that say he didn't. He did die because God says he did. And God buried him. Maybe through Michael. I mean, maybe that it doesn't say that in scripture, but maybe from Jude, we can say Michael was the one that made sure that he got buried. Um, but God did that. And he says this so that they would not. I, well, I can't remember if he says this or if I'm thinking this. So let me just say, I think the reason that God buried Moses is so they wouldn't make a shrine out of him and they wouldn't go and worship at his burial place. I think it's the same thing with Jesus. We're not really sure the tomb. We can go to Israel and we can see in Jerusalem tombs like where Jesus might be buried. And there are groups that believe they know which tomb it was. I'm just saying, I think the reason God doesn't show us those things is so we don't go to those places and make them into a shrine because Jesus' death is important, but he didn't stay there. That's what's important is that he left the tomb. <laughs> That's what's important. So these, in contrast, they revile angelic majesties. We shouldn't, and Michael didn't feel like he should. So there's a huge contrast there. And then we see, um, and you can put the contrast up there. You can just say like contrast to Michael. <laughs> Then it goes on in verse 10, and it's another but. So it's going back to uh, contrasting to Michael. These men revile things they don't understand. So it's one of our points. And then it says, and then, then the things they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things, they're destroyed. So have you ever known somebody like this, that just like everything they did was, was we wouldn't necessarily say purposely animalistic, but they don't think and they don't use reason and logic and they don't, they just, they just react and, and. We even have commercials out there, just do it, you know, do what feels good, whatever else. That's the kind of idea here to an extreme. So they're like unreasoning animals. And, and by those things, they're destroyed. So we can say, When my sons were playing football in the local high school, the behavior they described in the locker room was this. I, and I used to say it all the time, you know, animals have no self-control. As humans, we're supposed to exhibit self-control. As Christians, we're definitely supposed to, it's a fruit of the spirit, is self-control. Um, to give yourself the excuse that I just couldn't help myself and I don't care what you're talking about, you need to stop. I mean, if I say that, if I think that, I need to stop because I have the Holy Spirit in me. I am a human that can think. I have the ability, even before salvation, I have the ability to exhibit self-control. With the Holy Spirit, I have zero excuse. So keep in mind that that's a huge contrast to this group that just does whatever they want. It's the word sensuality, when we looked up licentiousness, if you remember this, the word sensuality came up. And anytime I used to hear the word sensuality, I would think like of a sensual woman, you know, a woman that was dressing a certain way and purposely flirting or whatever. That was the image I had, which is not wrong, but it's a small part of sensuality. So basically just take the word senses, our senses, and we've got five of them. And that's the sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. Those are our five senses. Thank you. <laughs> There's, I knew there was one coming. Um, those are our five senses. If we're satisfying 
our senses, that's sensuality. That's sensuality. It's so simple. You are just gratifying your flesh. Now, obviously, there's an extreme version of this, but just be careful that, again, and I'm going to use what I said earlier, don't eat sugar. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that if you eat one bite of sugar or you eat one piece of pie or whatever, that you're a horrible person and you end up on this list. I'm not saying that. But if you tell yourself, you know, I can indulge, I can whatever, then you need to maybe stop and ask yourself, is that exhibiting self-control? Am I just satisfying my senses? If it's just part of your celebration and it's not an act of sin, that's a different issue. Just kind of walk that line and try to decide. And of course, there is a slippery slope, as we know, if you start down a path, if, if you have an issue with weight, for instance, and I'm still trying to lose weight, then I can't tell myself this is not going to hurt me, you know, or this one little thing, because that one little thing usually leads to another little thing to another little thing and it snowballs. So just think about that. Unreasoning animals do not stop and think. They don't think of the consequences. They just act on their flesh. And that's what these people are likened to. So be careful with that. And they're destroyed by it. So put that over there in your, what's their end. Now in verses 11 and on, it says they've gone the way of Cain. They've rushed headlong into the era of Balaam and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Okay. So I'm just going to put those names up here. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Um, we know probably the story of Cain pretty well. It's one of the earliest stories of the Bible. And we know ultimately Cain murdered his brother. Um, there was a path he went down to get there. <clears throat> As you looked up the story this week, you, if to be reminded of it, and to remind of the details, the two brothers brought their sacrifices to God. Interestingly enough, there's nothing prior to that that describes why. There's no, there's no law. There is no God told them to. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you just kind of have to read and wonder about um and there's a lot of people that will explain away the difference in their sacrifices as one being an animal sacrifices where one was not Cain's was not but we also know years later thousands of years later in the law that grain offerings and libations being pouring out oils or pouring out wine all of those were part of the sacrificial system as well as the animal sacrifices so I don't necessarily look at Cain's sacrifice, what he brought, which was his work. That was his task, his plans. And he brought that to God. I'm not going to be able to say that it was wrong. God said it was not acceptable. That's all we know. God said it wasn't acceptable. So from that, even if in that moment, that was when Cain got his instruction. What did he do after that? So when he brought the sacrifice to God and God says, I don't accept it. God knew his heart. Maybe God had given instruction that we don't know about. And Cain had rejected it, <coughs> rejected the authority. But even at that moment, if that was the only time he was instructed, he was instructed that God said, I don't accept this. And it says his countenance, his face, his expression fell. And then God said to him, why has your countenance fallen? And then he warns him, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire is for you, is its desire is to overwhelm you. And instead of listening, Cain got jealous of his brother, lured his brother out and killed him. And then when he's brought, when God calls him up, um, Cain says, God says, where's your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer should be, you're actually your brother's murderer. You weren't his keeper, apparently, but you were his murderer. Um, and then God says, the, the ground cries out from his blood. 
It's a very interesting thing to say. Uh, there's other places that God, well, the Sodom and Gomorrah story, when, when the man is talking to Abraham, and we realize later it's not a man, but he says to, uh, well, God has said, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? Because Sodom and Gomorrah, are the sins are crying out to God. So there's, it, it's just an interesting thing. It's similar in the case of Cain, but he, um, that was the gone the way of Cain. So what would you say gone the way of Cain is? He's a murderer. He's jealous. He rejected authority, just like these others. Um, and then it says, and for pay, they rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. What is Balaam's story? Anybody want to tell it? I mentioned it earlier. <clears throat> It's a very interesting story. <laughs> I had just read about it recently. Um, Balaam is, was a prophet, obviously heard from God. This is very fascinating. He literally heard from God. He would inquire of the Lord and the Lord would talk to him, not some other devil, the Lord. When Balak, who was the king of Moab, sent for Balaam, to come and curse the Israelites because Balak was afraid of them. He knew what they had done to the Ammonites and others already, and he was afraid. There's, this horde is out there, and they're near his land, and he was afraid. Not giving him excuses, just telling you the, the situation. So he sends for Balaam. Balaam says, let me talk to God. The Lord says, don't go. And the people had brought money, and they left. Then another group is sent. Balaam goes back and asks God again, and this time the Lord says, go. Then he goes, and the Lord gets angry, and the Lord sends an angel to stand that he, Balaam can't see, but the donkey can, and the donkey turns to the side. Balaam beats the donkey, and eventually the donkey speaks and says, why are you beating me? This is also referenced in the New Testament when it says a dumb donkey, meaning can't speak, donkey, is given the voice of a man, and he speaks. Fascinating story, true story. Um, then his eyes are opened, he gets to see the angel, and he says, I'll go back. So there, all of this part of the story, you're looking at Balaam and going, he's not doing anything wrong. He's asking, he's being told no, he's asking, he's being told yes, He and God gets mad at him, so that tells you something, and then he says, I won't go if you don't want me to go, and the angel says, no, go, but you can't say anything that God doesn't want you to say. So each of the three times that he's presented to curse this group, he blesses them and said, it makes Balak mad. And that seems to be the end of the story until you go a few chapters over and you see that as they stayed near this, the Moabites and the Midianites, the women entice the men into idol worship, bringing them to their feasts feeding them food, sacrifice to idols, and sexual immorality, sleeping with them. A plague breaks out, and the son of Aaron, Phineas, um, stabs two of them, and it stops the plague. So we know God's pleased, and God even says, your house will be blessed forever because of what you did. So what we don't know yet, <laughs> is why did these Moabite women do this? Why did these Midianites and Moabites, why did they do this? How did they know to do this? And what we see in the story is that's what Balaam counseled. He knew he could not curse them because God put the words in his mouth and he couldn't not say what God told him to say. He knew that God says, I'm not gonna let you curse them because they're my people and they're blessed. The people kept bringing him money and even said, if you gave me everything in your kingdom, I can't not say what God wants me to say. But apparently he wanted the money because it says for pay. They entered into or rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. The error of Balaam is to be counseled to go into idolatry and sexual immorality. And Balaam did it for pay. He got paid to counsel them. So I call this the backdoor approach. If you can't go through the front door, you go get them through the back door. 
So if you can't directly curse them, you let them go into behavior that is going to destroy them. That's another group of people that were destroyed. So that's the error of Balaam. Now perished in the rebellion of Korah. You read about Korah this week. What did, who did Korah speak out against? Do you remember the story? Moses? Yes, and? And, um, I didn't write down the other. Moses and Aaron. Aaron. Oh, yeah, Aaron. Aaron. Yes. Moses and Aaron. <coughs> Basically, Korah was a Levite, which means he wasn't of Aaron's line. He was not going to be in the priests, but the Levites were set aside for the temple service. The Levites, the others other than Aaron and his line, were going to help serve Aaron and his family and were going to do all of the service of the uh, temple later, tabernacle during the Exodus time frame. And they were not going to get land. They Well, they weren't going to get a section of land. They got land within cities. And they were taken care of by the sacrificial system. Okay, so that's that's the, the fate in the of the Levites. Korah, who was a Levite, and then Dathan and Abiram, who were Reubenites and something else, um, decided they were just as good as Moses and Aaron. And basically said, who do you think you are that you're saying that you're more holy than us? All of us are holy. And Moses and Aaron got down on their faces and said, we'll let God decide. So the next day they had told 250 men that were with them to put <coughs> fire in their censers and censers just like a pan um, <coughs> or a... Um, even a censer can be a holder, but anyway, they put fire and incense and burn it before the Lord the next morning, first thing. And then God would decide. Okay, so between who God decided, did he decide for Aaron and Moses or did he decide for Korah and his group? He said he just asked Aaron him, Moses. He decided, yeah, he decided for Moses and Aaron. And the whole thing was Moses even said, as they confronted, he goes, if that you this group of people dies a normal death, then God's not with me. But if the ground opens up and swallows them whole, something has never happened before. And that's what happened. And the people that were around them that had kind of come along with them were warned and said, step back and step away or you're perishing with them. Okay, so this says, I'm gonna put perished up here because this is another. And that's what happened. 200, well, the, the ground swallowed up Korah and those that were with him. The 250 with fire pans were burned to a crisp. Their fire pans were taken, melted down and became the plate on the altar. So just think about that. Forever from that point forward, every time somebody saw that altar and saw the plate on the altar, it was from that, from those fire pans. Pretty good graphic reminder, I would think. Okay, so <clears throat> these people are like Cain, are like the error of Balaam, and are like Korah in his rebellion. You go back to what we know about them, rejecting authority, defiling the flesh, um, burning strange incense before the Lord, thinking more highly of yourself, putting down those that God has put in authority. None of that's good. Um, going around God's blessing and, and counseling a level of rebellion that led to a plague. That's what Balaam did. Okay. <clears throat> and then in 12 and 13, it gives some uh, interesting analogies. Tell me what they are. It likens them to what? Hidden, hidden reefs. Hidden reefs. And it says they feast without fear. 
clouds without water. Okay. Carried along by winds. Right. And then the autumn trees, right? Doubly dead. Yep. Okay. And then the wild waves. <clears throat> so I'm just, I'm putting foam down there just to, and then wandering stars. Okay, so we could go into great detail about every one of these, but we just we really do want to look at them and see. When you think of hidden reefs, if you were a sailor and you were on a ship, or I think I mentioned this in a previous lesson, we had just watched Swiss Family Robinson <laughs> recently, um, and you know the scene where the ship crashes up against the rocks. Um, those were actually exposed rocks. So let's think about um, when those of us that did the act study, remember Paul's harrowing journey to Rome, there's a point where the sailors were very, very, very concerned about this one area because they knew there were shoals and reefs underneath the water and they were in the middle of a storm. So they didn't, couldn't necessarily navigate and know exactly where they were going, but it was a huge concern because if you've got hidden reefs underneath the surface, what's gonna happen to your boat? Gonna wreck. Wreck it. it up. Rip that undercarriage, right? It's gonna rip it apart. And if a ship is in the water and it gets ripped out underneath, or if you think about what happened to the Titanic when it went up against that um um thing. I spoke. Thank you. I get my mind. Um, most of, if you've ever seen an iceberg picture, there's like a, a portion that's out of the water, but most of it's under the water. And I remember seeing a documentary one time about it. What it did was the ship actually just ran beside it and it ripped the hull. It didn't crash into it. It just ripped right there. It'd be like taking a, a like, you know, you've heard of somebody keying a car. We usually don't rip open the side, but if you were able just to walk down the side of a ship and just rip the hull apart, it's going to like it's going to be at water level or below. What's going to happen? It's going to fill up. That's what happens with hidden reefs. They're hidden. They're secret. Remember, these people crept in unnoticed. And then it says about them being hidden reefs, they're coming to their love fests. Now these are probably their communal meals. It could be their communion or Lord's Supper time frame, but their festivals, their gatherings, their eating together, anytime that they're gathering their love feast, they feast with you without fear. They're very comfortable. And that's not a good thing. And that's, this is one, I mean, our churches may not like have feasts and festivals all the time or even a regular meal together, but you do have some. You have fellowships, you have times together. And if these people are able to come in and be really comfortable there, and if nothing else, if you're just talking about your worship services, if they're coming and they're really comfortable there and they've crept in unnoticed, thing is their, their behavior is noticeable. That's the difference. It's not, don't give, I'm, I'm not giving myself the excuse of saying, well, we just don't know. You know, they look good. They say they're Christians, but we can look beyond. If you get to know them, at first you may not know, but after a while, you're going to know. So while they're hidden reefs, they're still there. And most sailors would have maps charted for those and they would want to avoid them. Or we have lighthouses that warn and tell you to stay at a distance to know not to come in. Then it says, and, the, and they're caring for themselves. And then it says they're clouds without water carried along by the winds. You know, there's another place in Timothy when Paul's writing to Timothy where he says, they're swayed by every wind of doctrine. So every new idea comes along and they just carry along with it. Every new um, great 
plan or teaching, you know, have you ever had those people that come along and every time they turn around, they're handing you some spiritual book that is not okay. Or they're listening. I'm, I'm sorry if I step on anybody's toes here to Oprah Winfrey. She's a very spiritual person. She is not a Christian at all. Um, she's one that said that she literally walked away from church because she heard of the pastor calling God a jealous God. The Bible calls him a jealous God. And she rejected that pastor and she rejected Christianity. And you see how she lives her life. But boy, she'll present these books. I've had people ask me to read them. Not good. That would be carried along by the winds. Um, autumn trees without fruit. And we know if you, if you know anything about fruit trees, when do they usually bear their fruit? It's the end of summer, it's going summer. into fall, right? So <clears throat> you have autumn trees without fruit. Now, obviously these would be fruit trees. So we're not going to expect a pine tree, <laughs> you know? So if it's a, if it's a fruit bearing tree and it has no fruit, they're doubly dead. They're, they're dying, it looks like, you know, the leaves are going to fall in the fall, in the autumn. So that's the death that, you know, the dormant period they go into. But if they go there and it's time for them to bear fruit and they have no fruit, they're a dead tree. And it's obvious at that point, right? It may not be obvious in the spring. It may not be obvious in the summer. It may not be obvious in the prior winter. But by the time it gets to fall and they should have fruit, it's obvious. And then it says they're doubly dead and they're uprooted or they should be uprooted. Um, it doesn't say should be, I'm adding that part, sorry. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, which the foam is very obvious. If you've ever been to the beach and you watch the waves come crashing in, most waves don't have a whole lot of foam, but the big crashing ones are going to leave that foam on the sand. What's, what about the foam? The foam is obvious. And it says they're casting their shame up like foam. So all of this it are hidden reefs, very dangerous. You've got um, clouds that are obvious with no water, meaning they have no value. They're not giving rain. They're not producing rain. And they're just carried along by the winds. And then you've got autumn trees, obvious, no fruit, doubly dead, uprooted waves casting up foam like it's their shame wandering stars <coughs> for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever this is obviously not referring to twinkly twinkle little star um talking about maybe more like the reference of angels being like stars these would be fallen angels but black darkness we know if we get away from our atmosphere we've seen pictures of outer space being very dark Okay, so there's a lot there that we can understand about these people based on these word pictures that were given about them. But one of the things you can take from it is they're obvious. Their behavior is showing them for who they are. So if they're obvious, we need to be doing, we need to be noticing. Right. Okay, so as we go through what their end will be, we did a lot, of, and there's cross referencing that we did this week also, like in Peter, where it talks about um, they never cease from sinning. <coughs> you can put that up there. Um, but just even within Jude, you have a very, very strong picture here. Um, and even if you go down to verse 16, <coughs> it calls them, I'm running out of rain here. I'll put it over here. They're grumblers. They find fault. What else does it say about them? They follow after their own lusts. They're arrogant. They flatter for the gain of an advantage. 
So that's more that we learn about this group of people. Now, as we <coughs> start looking at what their end is, it talked about earlier in verse four that their condemnation was long ago um, marked out. And we saw that that was like written down. It was absolute. It has already been determined. Um, they were destroyed like the Israelites. They perished like Korah or giving that analogy of Korah. They were judged just like the angels. It talks about the punishment of eternal fire. And eternal bonds, like the angels. They were destroyed by the things they um, know by instinct. It also talks about, it gives the word woe, which is never good from God. They're doubly dead. Black darkness reserved. And then uh, when you start looking in verse 14, like what we learned from Enoch, um, it says the Lord will come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. So that you don't mistake <laughs> ungodly, ungodly. And all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So the Lord is coming. He judges, he convicts according to their deeds. And the harsh things they spoke against him. And then in verse 23, it talks about snatching some out of the fire. So according to what we saw in Jude, but also what you saw in other cross-referencing this week, what's going to happen to what we can look out our windows and see right now? What's going to happen to this earth? What's going to happen to what we know of creation, all of what God has created? What's going to happen? It's going to be destroyed by fire. Right. Right. The elements are going to be melted. It's going to be destroyed by fire. There's not going to be any of what we know left, right? Right. And, but we can look forward to what? What are we looking for to happen after it's all destroyed? The new, the new kingdom of right. the God's kingdom that will live eternally with him. Right. So there's going to be a new heaven and new yes. earth. And we're going to be with him eternally. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so as we look at what are we to do, we're to be looking for that. Sorry, I just put it up here, but we're to look for this. But that doesn't mean we bring it about, but it means as we're living now, we have this hope and it should affect us somehow. It should affect our conduct. But we also need to start with, we are to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's us. It was, it was delivered once, but to each of us over and over and over, over time. We're also in verse 17 9, the 9 through 19, we're to remember the words spoken by the prophets.
And part of what we're to remember is that mockers will come and that whole part. That's what we see also in um, Second Peter, that those mockers will come. And in Second Peter, it was talking about those mockers are going to come and they're going to claim that nothing has changed from creation to now. And it even says, you can translate it, it says they, they're willfully ignorant. And in other words, they just like decided to forget that the flood happened. If there's nothing else, we know the flood and the flood changed so much. I mean, it wiped out everyone, but the eight that were on the ark and the animals that were preserved on the ark as well. So we have had a major difference since creation. And therefore God promised that that happened. We know it happened. And we know that every other promise he things have already been fulfilled that he promised, but there's also prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. And they are as certain to happen as the ones that have already happened. And there was usually a near fulfillment and then a far farther fulfillment of most of those as well. And in 2 Peter 3, it tells us we, in light of all this, are to be holy in our conduct, right? You've probably heard there's two books. One is How Now Shall We Live? And the other is How, how Something Very Similar. <laughs> it's a little bit <coughs> of a rearrangement of the words. And it comes from this passage. How should we live in light of this? All of this. How should we live in light? Okay. And I'm just going to present one thing. You're probably not on this list. If you're here, you're probably not on this list. So you could dismiss all this and say, I'm not doing these things, so I'm good. And, and I will praise you. That's great. But we have more to do. It's not enough for me to just do the right thing. It's not enough for me to follow what God says and, and ask for God's will to be revealed to me and abide by the Holy Spirit and, and do the fruit of the Spirit and anything else you want to come up with, that's great and that should be. That's the holy conduct. That's great. But who is on this list that you know that you need to be contending earnestly for the faith to? That you need to be, when it says contend, I don't remember the movie, but there's a quote that says, I want to be a contender, you know, like said in like a Jersey accent or something. The word contend means to fight. It means to grapple with someone else. So if we're to contend, we're to fight for the faith and earnestly. It's not enough to just be good. It's not enough to be right with God yourself only. We're also to stand up for God's faith. And especially in these love fests, in these group settings, where as you're, we're going to see next week, you've got these people that are doubting. You've got these people that are maybe needing to be snatched from the fire. They're not on this list yet. And it's in the sense of certainty and, and we never know until a person dies, we never know. There's always hope in my mind for anyone. I mean, Paul was a murderer. He will say he was the worst of them all um, and God saved him. So God saved me. So I can, I can know God can save anyone. I don't know their salvation or their final destination but I just know that if they really are on this list, their condemnation is marked out. And if they really are on this list and aren't going to change and they're in our love fests, we need to do something about that. So the question is, are the ungodly only really nasty, horrible murderers sinners that are just awful, awful, awful? Or are they unbelievers? 
are they rejecting authority? Casting doubt, does it really have to be that way? Are they denying our only Lord and Master? Not necessarily saying Jesus didn't exist, because that's what I used to always think when I saw that, and that would be true. How else, just think about these things, how else can somebody deny Jesus as Master and Lord? If Jesus fulfilled the law, and he did, and in doing so said, keep my commandments, which are God's commandments, and there's someone that's not doing that, then they're denying his authority. And over and over, it talks about immorality. Immorality is probably the most prevalent category that's going on. So as you think through who is in your life, who can you potentially be speaking to? Who are you spending your time with? Who are you sitting in church with? Who are you inviting to your home? Or you're going to their home? Or you're in a group setting? And it's a Christian setting. Who is claiming to be a Christian? And um, yet they're in gross immorality or murdering, or reviling in majesties, or defiling their flesh, or somebody else's flesh, whatever in this list, it may not be a nasty person. It may be a really nice person that is not saved. And by their statements, by their behavior, how they're living their life and the example they're living, they're impacting the group. And they may claim to be a Christian. You may want to believe they're a Christian. You may even have told yourself, who am I to say they're not? And I'm not saying I'm running around <laughs> getting to decide, but I am saying, according to this, their shame is cast up like foam. Their fruit is not there. Therefore, we know they're a dead tree. They're just being cat pulled. They're just like nice and dreamy. And they're just going along with every new idea. But they have no rain. They're giving no value. What are the other ones? Hidden reefs. There's somebody that can come along and literally be destroyed because they're just comfortably sitting in our love feasts our church services. It's tough, folks. This is tough. And I know none of us want to run around and say any of this to anybody. But if we believe this part, if we believe the destruction, the eternal punishment, the eternal darkness, the eternal fire, the eternal bonds, the lake of fire that we saw this week that they're going to be cast into. And remember that group of people that separate, Jesus separated the sheep from the goats. And they said, when did we not visit you? When did we not? When did we do these things to you, Jesus? And he says, when you didn't do them to my brothers. So it can be that mild. It's not necessarily the big and nasty. It's just, if you're not a Christian, if you truly aren't saved, and that will be shown at some point in time, it will be shown. And if nothing else, we're told that we need to be examining our own salvation. We need to be looking within our own selves and not wishfully thinking that because I've done this or I've said that or whatever, that I'm saved, but Ask God to show you and prove to you whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. Because it talks about being devoid of the Spirit. That's another one we could put up here. Devoid of the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved. So I just, I guess the encouragement I have to you for me as well is <coughs> we have a responsibility to contend for the faith, to not 
be okay with people that are not truly saved because they're impacting others. And we need to be worried about that. But we also don't want them in this condemnation. So we want to speak up. So this is where I say, I'm not going to shrug and say, go to hell. Because if I don't say something, that is what I'm doing. I saying, I don't care. I don't care if this happens to you. I just care about me. I care about me not being uncomfortable. I care about me being liked by you. Many of you have heard me say these things before. It comes up so many times in scripture. And part of it's because I've had to be convicted about this. And over and over and over again. I've had to be convicted. Like, do I care enough? You know, when, when Jesus directs us or through Paul or whoever to love our enemies, he doesn't say they're not your enemy. He says they are your enemy and you're to love them. And it's not going to be an emotion. I'm not going to be able to drum up that feeling. It's going to be a conscious choice on my part to care enough about their eternal state to say something to them or pray for them. You know, I may not be able to physically be with them or talk to them. They may have kicked me out of their life, um, but I may be able to pray for them that somebody would come in and the truth would be revealed. That's loving them. That's not saying I hate them and I want them to go to hell. I don't want that for anybody. So anybody have any other that they came up with this week or something we didn't cover? <coughs> There's a lot. Amazing how parallel Second Peter is. But Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount at the very end of it, he says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, notice. It says they deny him as Lord and Master, but they may still call him that. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they're going to say, but we cast out demons in your name. We did all of these miracles in your name. I don't remember all of them. But, and I read that and go, I didn't do those things. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity or workers of the different translations call it different things. Meaning you did that on your own power. You did that in the flesh. You didn't do that by the spirit because you're devoid of the spirit. And he says, depart from me. That's the last thing I want said to anybody. I would rather be able to say, what I want for myself and for you is well done by earnestly contending for the faith, good and faithful servant. My holy in conduct, remembering the words spoken, looking for the new heaven and new earth. If I'm looking for the new heaven and new earth, I know this one passes away and everything death and Hades goes with it into the lake of fire. And I believe that. And that should compel us in how we are to live. Not easy, not easy to hear. And these are people we love. And we would he, he said it was sobering. And that's how, that's how I feel about it. Is it sobering? Very sobering. Um, that, that's a very good way to put it because it, I mean, look how quiet we are. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard to have anything to say to this. Um, obviously I don't have a problem with that, but <laughs> I mean, I'm talking a lot, but it's not easy. And if, if people haven't come to mind, I'm sure they have, but these can be the people we love the most and we want them to be Christians and we want them to be saved and we want to believe that about them, but we can't grandmother them in. I wish we could, but we can't. We can't plead with God 
and say, but that's one I like. Let them in. It doesn't work that way. As much as we'd like it to, it doesn't work that way. It is very sobering, Cindy, that you're right. Very sobering. Well, we're going to end this. Um, and again, as usual, take a break and come back for the video. Um, thanks for hanging with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sobering truth and the, and the absoluteness of it and the reality of what it is. Thank you, Father, that we're saved from it, not based on anything we deserved, but based completely and totally on what Jesus did. And all we did was believe it and accept it. And you applied to us salvation, righteousness, justice, mercy, so much mercy and grace. We're so grateful, Father. And from this, Father, we want to have that certainty and that scaredness, that sobering reality of how we are to live, but also how are we to contend for your faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And in so doing, not deny Jesus, not only as our master and Lord, but the one who saved us, the one who died for all of this, who gave up his life in place of mine. We thank you for it, but it's also sobering. It's a huge, huge, huge price that was paid by someone else on my behalf. I thank you for that. And I thank you for my salvation and for all, everyone's salvation that is here. We ask that you will guide us into this last lesson, but also into the lecture from Kay, into your truth. We ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stop.